Okay, I'm very excited to have Professor Terry O'Dean from the University of California at Berkeley. He is a specialist in behavioral finance. I have known Terry for decades, much longer than he's actually known me, because when I started on Wall Street about 20, 25 years ago, we studied his work about behavioral finance, which, as I describe to normal people, is the study of why do people do the dumbest things even when they know the right thing that they should do. Terry, real pleasure to have you. Thanks, Doug. Glad, glad to be here. So I understand you're actually going to begin teaching a course that's available to everyone, not just students at Berkeley, about making smart financial decisions. So I was hoping that we could kind of have a shortcut today to understand some smart financial decisions that people could make. Tell me, what are some of the biggest risks that people have that maybe we could make them a little smarter about? Well, in my course, I'm going to cover a few topics. We'll look at, at saving and spending, at credit and debt, insurance, uh, investments, and at issues around retirement. So there are different... Uh, saving, probably the biggest problem people have today is that they're not saving enough. And since in the U.S. we have had a big switch from traditional pensions, where if you were lucky enough to have a pension, when you got to retirement, you would get an income for life, to what are called defined contribution pensions, such as 401k plans, where the responsibility for saving enough and then for making good investments falls with the worker. So that's a, that's a tough problem for people, and it's one of the reasons that people aren't saving enough. Okay, let, course, let, I just want to go step by step. So you said saving, sure. spending was the next one. So where are we? Where's the problem there? Well, <laughs> or are they connected to saving? Yeah, I'd say they're related. If you're not saving enough, you're probably spending too much, and uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. And among them, it's just easier to spend too much today than it was when I was growing up. My parents, my parents didn't have credit cards, so they they couldn't spend on uh, you know on money that they didn't have. It was very difficult for for them to do so. Uh, there were a lot of things that were were different in the fifties than now, but basically, it's easier to spend money now. And then, as I say, it's harder to know how much you need to save because my, my dad was a high school teacher. My mom was a high school teacher. They basically knew that if they worked at their jobs for you know, 35, 40 years, they would have enough in retirement. So they didn't have to ask themselves questions. Are we spending too much? Spending was very simple. You spend do not spend more than you get each month because there's no way to do so. When the money's gone, it's gone. <laughs> Today, people have credit, and it makes it very hard, easy to get in trouble and easy to spend too much. Okay, we're going to dig into that. So we said saving, spending, credit. What are the issues with credit? Well, the big thing with, uh, with credit and credit cards are that you have to pay off your credit card at the end of every month. If you can't maintain the discipline to pay off your credit card uh, in full at the end of every month, you'd be better off not using a credit card. Mm -hmm. So you're of, the, you're of the, the school of cutting up your credit cards. And the last one is insurance. What are the areas that people have problems with? So the big thing with insurance is, first of all, figure out what you need and you don't need. For example, life insurance. If someone is dependent financially dependent on you, someone you love, child, spouse, occasionally, you know, sometimes an aging parent is financially dependent upon you. You need life insurance. If nobody's financially dependent upon you, you don't need life insurance. Second, if you buy life insurance, you should buy term life insurance. I go into that in more detail in my course as to why. Uh, the other thing is, if you have homeowner's insurance or automobile insurance, regularly Go out and get new quotes. Like every three years, go out and get quotes from three or four different companies for exactly the same terms on a policy. It's, it's surprising, but the prices that companies charge vary, sometimes vary quite, quite a bit. I spent, it took me a few hours to do this. It took more than 15 minutes, but I spent a few hours doing this, uh, oh, three, four months ago. I saved myself seven, eight hundred dollars a year. Wow. So it's, 
you know, I can't guarantee everyone's going to save that much. I perhaps had waited too long between intervals of <laughs> uh, of shopping, but uh, it's it's worth it's worth doing. So the big thing with insurance is figure out what you need, uh, figure out what you don't need, shop, and if you want to get your if if you want to get, for example, your auto insurance premiums down to pay less, consider taking a bigger deductible, you know, a, a bigger deductible on your collision and your comprehensive insurance. Choose a deductible that won't be a disaster for you. You don't want it so high that it's going to set you back. But if it's, you know, if it's inconvenient, that's okay. It'll save you, it'll save you money in the long run. We're talking with Professor Terence O'Dean, a finance professor at the University of California, Berkeley. He's going to be teaching an online course called Making Smart Financial Decisions. He's given us a little bit of a preview. Now, Terry, I want to dive in because please don't take this the wrong way, but you sound a little bit like you're preaching, like the kind of thing my mother would tell me. It's important to save and don't spend more than you have and don't use your credit. Oh, fine. Yada, 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 as they say. So let's go dig into some of these a little more and see some of the, the complexities complaints that people have about this. And frankly, I'm wondering if these are some of the questions you're going to have to address in the class. And well, number one is, it's hard to save. You talk about saving, but it's just not easy. People, they're not making as much as they would like, and there are real expenses that they have. What do you recommend to someone who says, yeah, you're telling me to save, but what do I do? Okay. Uh, that's a very good question. And I'm quite clear in my class that Although I'm, I, I am encouraging people to save, I realize it can be very difficult. There are a couple of steps that you can take to make it a little easier. The first is automate your savings. So if you are working at a company with a 401k plan, get your have a money put straight into your 401k account. Uh, you know, e each month, try to raise how much you're putting in. Uh, if you don't have a 401k plan, you have in the U.S., for example, an IRA, an uh, individual retirement account, automate that so that when, you're, when your paycheck comes in, money gets put in that account automatically. Don't wait to the end of the month and say, well, I'll put whatever's left, left over at the end of the month into saving. Another idea, it's a great idea, not mine, came from my friends Richard Thaler and Shlomo Benarzi, is called uh, Save More Tomorrow. Now, I know that sounds like a procrastinator's dream, but the idea is this. Commit now to raising your savings rate sometime in the future. Oftentimes, that might be when you get a raise. So you might say, okay, I really can't squeeze anything more out of my paycheck right now. But next time I get a raise, maybe I'll commit to putting half of that money into savings. And the time after that, when I get a raise, I'll put half that money into savings, half that raise until I get to whatever my target level is of saving. And that, I, I think that's a, a pretty good way to automate raising your savings and to make it palatable. I'm not claiming easy, but to make it a little easier. All right. So we have automate savings and commit to a savings rate in the future. Let's move on just because I'm sure you have other ideas and people have to take the course for that. But you talk about not spending more than you have. And well, one of the interesting things about credit is it allows you to actually live a better life today than you would otherwise be able to do. Now, between you and me, and don't tell me when I said this, I agree with you that you shouldn't uh, run up credit card debt. But, you know, a lot of people say, and I see the argument, interest rates are relatively low, or, or not even that. They'll just say, I want to own this today. I can diversify the purchase over time by borrowing the money. And what the heck? The government's doing it too. I'm just learning from my congressman about, uh, about paying tomorrow for enjoying things today. Why wouldn't someone do that? Well... I'd say if you own the printing presses for money, circ circumstances are different uh, than if you are putting money on a credit card. Uh, interest rates on credit card debt are not low. Uh, That's they true. Are, okay. they, it's a very, very expensive uh, way. If you actually have savings, think about this for a moment. Suppose you do have savings in the bank or in, in an account and you have some of your money invested in bonds, relatively safe, where can you get 16% a year? Yeah, it's a tricky one. <laughs> Nowhere. But where can you pay 16% a year? To your credit, your credit card company will be, hard, it will be happy to charge you that. It's a very expensive way. I, um, 
I talk about a book in one of my videos. I obviously didn't write the book uh, called Happy Money. And one of the themes in, in the book goes through ways to spend your money that will make you happier. And one of the points they, they make is they say, say you're giving this argument, say, I really want to take a vacation. Oh, I want to take a vacation. And I think I'll just put it on the card and pay for it over the next year. Well, generally, people, generally, you'll be happier if you delay the vacation. You can enjoy planning it, enjoying thinking about what a great time you'll have. Then you go and have a great time and you're not, there's no nagging feeling of, gee, you know, this is a bit expensive. And when you get home, you can think back on the memories of your great vacation without also thinking, yeah, but I still owe thousands of dollars, uh, you know, uh, on the card. So I think if you can delay delay your gratification, uh, you'll probably be happier and you certainly will end up wealthier. Well, it's true, I hear. But as my nephew says, spending money on your credit card is like delayed gratification only now. So, <laughs> yeah. But it's funny what you said. There was a great, uh, I think, a professor at Yale named Sean Aker, who he's got a TED Talk. I've actually spoken to him on my radio show, Goldstein on Gelt. He talks about what is it about money that makes people happy, and he's done a number of experiments. And it seems the number one thing that makes people happy with money is actually giving it to other people. And I think that's an important lesson that when you buy stuff, it, it doesn't really help. It, does, it doesn't make you happy, happier in the stress of having to pay it off at some point, because at some point you have to pay the piper, uh, can, can really eliminate the joy you get from it. But answer one more question on this is, you know, some people say, listen, I'm going to run up the bills and I've seen other people default on their credit cards. I'll just do it too. Why do you recommend against that? Well... Okay, there are a lot of reasons to <laughs> recommend against that. Uh, not the least of which is it's a it's a very difficult strategy, certainly in the U.S. these days, to uh, run up your credit card debt and then declare um, bankruptcy. The uh, bankruptcy laws were changed a few years back, and if your income is above the median income in your state you probably won't be allowed to declare Chapter 7 bankruptcy, which would be um, where your, your consumer debt was fully discharged. Instead, you're going to end up with a repayment plan, and you will sooner or later have to repay that debt. Uh, so that is the practical argument. Uh, there, of course, would be an ethical argument, which you could, we could leave for another show, but I think some people would feel that that was an unethical uh, approach. Personally, I think it would be a very stressful way to live. I don't think that would make me happier, but of course each person could answer that for themselves. <laughs> but I guess the short, the more the more pressing answer is it doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. Okay, not a good strategy, which is borrowing money and then not paying it back, which some people, as you pointed out, ethically would call stealing. Uh, Terry, okay, let's go to the last point that you raised, which was about insurance. And you came right across the board and said you should not buy whole life insurance, you should buy term insurance. And I think the logic that people uh, usually put to that is they say the point of insurance is to insure you against something that you cannot afford. But the insurance companies would certainly have a word to say with you about that one, not the least of which is saying some people aren't able to save. They have tax benefits of saving internet through an insurance policy. Uh, if they die when the market is down, their heirs are not going to lose. Why are those problems? Well, the analysis that I've seen suggests that on average, you can get better investment returns and the same life insurance coverage if you separate your uh, insurance and investing into term life insurance and then you know investing in mutual funds or other products there may be people for whom you know who have unusual circumstances who would benefit from uh, one of these more complex products, they do tend to be very expensive. So the fees that are being charged tend to be quite high. You can get mutual funds that charge much, much lower fees. But there's an, one of the themes in, you know, in my class when I teach my undergrads about personal finance, I bring up often, is that complexity is the enemy of the consumer. So financial services industries like complex products 
And one of the reasons they like complex products is because it makes it difficult for consumers to compare the prices on different products because you got a bunch of different products. They all have different bells and different whistles and you get attracted to a feature and you have no clues to whether you're paying way too much for that feature. One thing I like about term life insurance, here's how simple it is. I get term life insurance. I get a level policy, maybe for 10 years, maybe for 20 years, whatever meets your needs. You know how much you're going to get paid. You know what you're going to pay in uh, premium, and you know the circumstances under which you're going to get paid. <laughs> it's really simple. So you just say to yourself, I want a million dollar policy or a $500,000 policy or whatever it is. I want, I, I need it for 10 years or I need it for 20 years. I want to know what it's going to cost me. You can compare that. All that's left now, as long as you're dealing with companies that are financially sound, uh, what's left is what's the premium. Very easy. These other policies, very complicated, much harder to know whether you gain the better or the worse deal. And as you said, complexity is the enemy of the consumer. Terry, I really like that. And I think on that note, we're going to wrap it up for today. Uh, just tell me in the last few seconds, how can people learn about you, learn about your work, and learn about this course? Okay, so the probably the easiest way is to go to my website, Odean, O-D-E-A-N dot org, O-R-G. At the top, I have a link to the sign-up sheet for the course. The course is free. It's free to the public. It starts April 15th. Uh, there's also a link to my YouTube channel where people can watch a sample of videos uh, from, from the course. Alternatively, one can go to the edX website. The course is hosted on ed ed edX and uh, search for Making Smart financial decisions. Okay, so that was odin.org is probably the easiest way to get there. Terry Odin, thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Doug. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world, but if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.